Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode two of Hanging with the Hero. I'm Dave Azer. I'm so glad that you're able to join us again. And we have an incredible guest. This guy is a hero, whether or not he would like to admit it. Dr. Charles Powell is joining us. He is Mount Sinai's Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. He's also the CEO of Mount Sinai's National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute. How are you, Dr. Powell? I'm good today. Thanks very much for asking, and thanks very much for having me on the show today, Dave. Appreciate it. it oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. We're going to talk about the work that you've done at Mount Sinai in New York City because it is truly remarkable and very innovative. First thing I want to ask you is, how are things now in New York City as compared to a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, when it seemed like it was just really, really depressing and sad and scary there? Yeah, well, things are different now. Things are not good, but they're different. About a month ago, we were really worried that we wouldn't be able to take care of all the patients who were coming into our hospital and the other hospitals in New York who had COVID. We were concerned that we wouldn't have enough beds, enough ventilators, enough people to care for all those who were sick. And really, that worry was driven by the predicted models that we had of how many patients might need hospitalization for COVID. And early on, those models suggested that in New York City, and in Mount Sinai in particular, there might be up to 20,000 people who needed to be hospitalized at one time in our hospitals. And that's a big problem because at our max, we only have 4,200 beds. And that was based upon a New York where there was no social distancing. And we we're hopeful that social distancing would have an impact, and it did. And every day over that month, the number of projected patients needing Mount Sinai hospitalizations decreased by one to 2,000 or more, such that we hit our peak on April 8th with 1,800 patients in our hospital that we could care for. So that changed the tone from being concerned that we couldn't care for everybody to now knowing that we can care for everybody and the concerns now are emphasized on making sure we're doing the best for patients who have this new disease. And that's where we are right now. And, and so then let's go back to that time a few weeks ago, the, the really scary time when you're worried about caring for everybody. And, and the rest of us who don't live in New York City have watched the news and we know about the shortage of ventilators. So Talk me through what you and your team did and the innovation that led to saving some lives. Sure, so one of the other roles that I have is I am the Director of Respiratory Therapy Services for the Mount Sinai Health System too. So I am in charge of making sure that we have the adequate equipment and the adequate people to take care of, of patients who need a ventilator, for example. And so we knew early on, once the pandemic was spreading from China to the United States, that there was a chance it could hit New York. And if it did hit New York at the high levels, at the upper end of the estimates, that we would need more ventilators than we had on hand. So starting in January, we started to buy ventilators from everywhere, from the United States and overseas. So we increased our stockpile of ventilators from 600 up to 1400 with orders placed to get us to 2,000, a number that we thought might be adequate if the projections were at the lower end, but would not be adequate if indeed we were gonna have more patients than we thought would be possible. So we needed We've hit a snag at our connection. Dr. Powell, are you there? Dr. Powell is here, he's with us. In the hospital. And one of the limitations is we prefer not to use a mask for a patient in the hospital with COVID because the virus can spread outside of the mask from around the outside edges of the mask and through the holes in the mask and put then any healthcare worker in the room at increased risk of exposure. So we prefer not to use that. So then we came up with the question, can we take these devices that are used at home for patients who have 
sleep disorders and convert them into a device that could take care of a patient who is in an ICU with COVID-related pneumonia who is now going to be ventilated through an endotracheal tube. That's a plastic tube that goes into the throat and then into the lungs. So can we then convert these machines to be able to be used in that setting? That was a question we asked our team. We're really fortunate to have a team of experts in sleep physiology and sleep devices who've had experience actually in, even in developing BiPAP machines, inventing them many years ago. And so when I asked that question, they said, yeah, we can do that. I said, okay, good, how? Right. <laughs> give, me, give me a little bit of time. So we gave them a night, and during that night, they wrote up a protocol about how to connect these home devices to an endotracheal tube. And then the next day, we took that, that construct, the, the tubing and the ventilator, into the simulation lab that we have here that is world-class as well. And then we were able to test the device, see how much power it had, see what limitations there might be, see what was the best order for the different parts of the circuitry so we could know how powerful the machine was, how much air it could deliver, how much oxygen it could deliver. We changed some things around, made it even better. And then we tested it in the clinical setting and it worked. And then we made the protocols widely available and, and, and that is where we took this, this initiative. It's just so remarkable, you know, there's that expression, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. And for, for all of, of you and your team, um, clearly you're, you're scientists, your brain works in that way, but to come up with this solution, there's no time during all of this for any uh, con congratulations. It's obviously a very dangerous and difficult time, but was there a moment of pride for you and your team where you took a step back and you, and you just said to yourself, wow, look what we've done. Yeah, it was. it was. So when we took this into the clinical setting, we had a, a patient, we were able to swap out the conventional ventilator, and then we put in this circuitry from this ventilator, and we turned it on, and you couldn't even tell that there was a change in the ventilator. Patient was fine, it got a, the patient was getting exactly what they were getting before. And so then we really knew that we had something that was clinically important, clinically effective. That was, that was a very gratifying, rewarding moment. Yeah, that was good. And, and it's also, I know that you made some modifications to it where um, you'll have to explain this, the science of it, but you, you made it so that it was safe for everyone else in the room. No, no particles, I guess, were escaping. Something yeah. like that. Is that close to right? Yeah, it's very right. So we had, we had anywhere there is a possibility for air to escape, there was a filter placed, a HEPA filter that, that traps all the virus. So there was no opportunity for the virus to be expelled into the air. So it was effective and it was safe. It was, it was good. And another modification where you enabled the, the nurses or the doctors or whomever else to operate the machine from outside of the room. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, um, almost like a car. So you have a, the car, the standard car, which you can drive. So the, what I described to you thus far is really the, the standard car that drives, in, in essence, gives the ventilation. And then you can get the option packages. And so we were able to make the options really quite cool in this case. So what we were able to do was to make this so you can monitor the ventilator from outside of the room and you know, further option was to be able to remotely control the ventilator from outside the room, which is not what we can typically do for any ventilator in the hospital right now. And that's particularly important to have in the setting of COVID, where if you need to make just a minor setting right now, change a minor setting change right now, you need to walk into the room and, and turn a knob. But with a remote control option here, you can do it from outside of the room and not need to expose anybody to the increased risk of exposure within the room, albeit small, but it's greater than zero. And so we can get it to zero by not going into the room. That's what we want to do. So yeah. Remarkable. Do Remarkable. All right, we are, we're live on Zoom and we're also simulcasting this on Facebook Live. So what I want to do is, because we have a lot of people who are watching, if you're watching on Facebook Live, um, go ahead and ask some questions. And there's a bit of a delay, but no problem. I'll get the questions over to Dr. Powell, you have a chance to talk to an MD right now, a specialist in, in, in what we're all dealing with. 
So if you have any questions, like I said, fire away. And if you are just tuning in, let me just reintroduce our guest of honor today. This is Dr. Charles Powell. He is Mount Sinai's Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine in New York City. He's also the CEO of Mount Sinai's National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute. When I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about, and, and obviously the innovation piece is, is so fascinating, I, I just wanted to ask you if you could explain mentally, emotionally, to take that Hippocratic Oath now, uh, to be a doctor, to be a nurse, to be a healthcare worker, I, you know, you all are heroes because you're, you're, you're sacrificing your own safety, you're jeopardizing your own safety. When you get into the office, when you get into the hospital every day, you know, what do you do? How do you, I don't know, turn that part of your brain off or how do you just push forward knowing how contagious this is? Yeah, I, I think that's been one of the um, real important concepts that's been reinforced every day. You know, we've all been in medicine for a while and we're all, I can speak for most of us, we're really proud of what we do every day. And we feel that part of the reason we're really proud of what we do every day is that we make a difference. But never has that been as clear as it is right now in the COVID setting. I'm surrounded by colleagues every day, whether they be nurses or respiratory therapists or doctors who don't even think twice about going into a patient's room and taking care of them with COVID, understanding that those patients can potentially expose them to a virus that could make them sick. Yes, everybody is protected. We all wear our protective equipment and we're all trained in how to do it. But then again, when we're going in those rooms, the risk is greater than zero. And every single doctor here steps up. Every single nurse steps up, doesn't think twice, respiratory therapists across the board to do what we all consider to be our duty. And that's to help the patients in our hospital. And, and that's where the heroism is. It's in those frontline workers who cross that threshold every day to take care of the patients who are sick in our hospitals and, and sick in the outpatient clinics. That's, it's become really quite clear. That's why I think every doctor, nurse, healthcare worker gets chills in New York yeah. City in particular, seven o'clock every night when driving home. That's typically shift change. And when we're all driving home and we hear the, the hands being clanged and, and the, the cowbells and the clapping, people standing on the street, and now even the singing, it, we really ap appreciate that we are appreciated as a profession for what we do. And, and that's a, it's, a, it's a unique feeling that's never happened in New York before. And, and that's why it's such an honor for me to speak with you and please express the appreciation of, of all of our viewers and everyone here in South Florida to your team. Uh, just because we watch the news and we see we see the heroism. Okay, we are getting some questions. Sure. Uh, this is one from somebody who just joined in a few minutes ago who says, I might have missed this. This is from Lindsay. I might have missed this, but are there other hospitals utilizing the technology that you created? So I mentioned that we hit our peak on April the 8th. And when we hit our peak, we had about 1,800 patients in the hospital. We have and had more than enough ventilators, conventional ventilators to take care of our patients. We consider the, the modification of the home device as a strategy to use in the absence of having enough conventional ventilators. So we feel very fortunate that we haven't had to utilize the home ventilators as a routine approach for patients because they have enough. So what have we done? We've made our protocols widely available, freely available, to all through our internet website, through webinars that were hosted by the state and by the New York Hospital Association. And we've been contacted by the state governments in New Mexico and by governments around the world in South Africa, and we've made our protocols available. We've also made the home devices that were donated to us available too. They're being distributed by the state of New York to hospitals in New York that may have demand. And then they'll also be made available to other hospitals around the country that may have a need as well. And even when COVID is over, there are under-resourced areas within the United States and around the world 
that even outside of COVID may need additional ventilators and using this protocol and these devices may be a strategy for them. So that's where our focus has been redirected towards. Has there been an overall spirit of collaboration in the medical community, whether it be clinical trials or uh, your innovation or, or anything where you'll get into work and you'll hear or read about a doctor somewhere around the country or around the world who's trying something? All the time. It's been a real pay it forward type of culture. It, it started in China. Um, before this all happened, I had relationships with five different hospitals in China, pulmonary hospitals in particular, for research and clinical purposes. Many of the doctors that I worked with in China actually were deployed to Wuhan, which is the epicenter in China, where about 40,000 doctors were sent to care for all those patients there. Amongst those doctors were four who I worked with from other hospitals in China. So they gained experience very quickly. We did a teleconference with those doctors before the disease came to New York. We peppered them with questions about their experience. We peppered them with questions about what treatments seemed to be effective and what didn't seem to be effective. And that helped to prepare us. Same thing with doctors from, from Europe. We have colleagues in Spain and Italy and France and, and they paid it forward to us. And we're doing the same. So we are talking about our experience, we're publishing our experiences from New York so that others in the country and others around the world can learn what we're learning and be able to advance our state of knowledge about the different diagnostic tests we're using and the treatments that may be effective and so that others can benefit from what we've been able to learn. That's the culture of medicine now. Have you seen um, any particular drug or medicine that, that you think is, um, is, is worthy of, of people being optimistic about? I know I was watching the news, I guess it was yesterday, that hydroxychloroquine, there was a, the most recent sample, wasn't, I guess, wasn't a good survey, a uh, good study, the results weren't great. Where are we in terms of, of treatment options? Well, I think it's fair to say none of us have been very excited well, maybe one person's been excited. <laughs> Most of us have not been very excited about hydroxychloroquine and as a treatment. But many, many centers used it because if patients are tested to make sure their hearts are normal first, it's relatively safe. And, and maybe, maybe there's a little bit of benefit. Not excited. But there have been some other treatments that have been much more promising. And if I were to, just to go through them briefly, so there's some antiviral treatments that are in various stages of clinical trial. And you need to do clinical trials to establish whether a treatment is effective or not. And so the, the antiviral remdesivir has been already published in an uncontrolled study, and it seemed to give a signal of being effective in some patients. That was very, that was very promising. It's not a magic bullet. It's not going to take care and cure everybody, but it may be helpful in many patients. Convalescent plasma is another therapy that's being used in patients. Mount Sinai is a leading institution in terms of the number of patients being treated with convalescent plasma in the United States right now. And the, the principle of that is if you give it early, the thought is that it can uh, absorb or, and take the virus out of the bloodstream, if you will, from patients who are infected. And we don't have formalized data analysis yet. There's an overall feeling, well, overall perception, it's more than a feeling, based upon our experience that it may be helpful too. And then the third agent that seems to be showing some promise now is a, a treatment that uses mesenchymal stem cells. So th these are early cells in the bloodstream that can turn into other kinds of cells in, as they mature in the body. And they're, they're typically obtained from healthy individuals and then they're processed and then administered to patients such as those who have COVID. Uh, it's used in, in other conditions before being used in COVID. And the principle of this is that it, it's intended to try and soak up some of the inflammatory mediators and cytokines that get released in severe COVID infections. So we've had a series of patients here that have been treated with mesenchymal stem cells. And again, the signal seems to suggest that it's effective. And now randomized trials are going to be conducted 
so we can compare patients treated with mesenchymal stem cells to patients who aren't. So those are just three examples of some therapeutics that show some promising signals of being effective in this disease. It is remarkable on the outside looking in at how quickly all of this is happening. I know clinical trials take years. Yes. And we're a couple of months into this, and now you just gave three options. We have about 10 minutes or so left with Dr. Powell. I know we've got people watching us here on Facebook Live, so I want to spend the rest of the time uh, taking questions from people, and I also want to chat with you about kind of the new normal, what what it's going to look like going forward as we all sort of get reacclimated into society. I have a question here from Ronnie who says, are hospitals in New York using high dosages of intravenous vitamin C? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Keep your questions coming. If you are watching on Facebook Live, if you are just tuning in, we are with Dr. Charles Powell, Mount Sinai's Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine and the CEO of Mount Sinai's National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute. He is on the front lines. He is dealing with COVID patients every day. And if you missed earlier in our conversation, his innovation, he and his team uh, was incredible with regarding uh, transforming these sleep apnea machines into ventilators and it made a huge difference. So let's talk about what's going to happen going forward. Uh, you know, here in South Florida, there is talk that Florida is going to be open for business pretty soon. Georgia is open for business in, in many regards already. Um, I know the conversation has been New York and New Jersey, and maybe that's going to take a little longer. But as it starts to happen around the country, to you, a physician, what do you think that new normal looks like for people? Well, let me take that on by just stepping back for a moment if I could. So usually when there's a pandemic being contemplated, the, the approach is to have a strategy to contain the virus. And so the way that works is that when the virus first appears, you have ability to test for the presence of the virus, know who's positive, trace all the contacts of individuals who are positive, isolate them and prevent the virus from spreading in a widespread fashion and prevent it from being a situation that is out of control. That's how you deal with a pandemic. We didn't do that. We missed the containment phase. We didn't have testing. We didn't have contact tracing. So we skipped containment and went right to mitigation. Mitigation is when you use social distancing to try and do other measures to reduce person-to-person -person spread. That worked. I spoke about how in the beginning we had projections that there would be up to 20,000 people hospitalized in the Mount Sinai health system with COVID. And I told you how that number is not possible to sustain, but that was a real number. And I also should tell you that that number went down by one to 2,000 to 3,000 every day after social distancing was developed and implemented in New York. That was around March 16 through 18 and March 22 when it really became formal. And then every day after that, the number of cases that were anticipated to be a peak went down and that allowed us to have a peak much lower than we expected. That is the only thing that changed between the first prediction of 20,000 and where we ended at 1800, social distancing. It worked and it still works. That is what we have. You cannot move from mitigation until the virus is decreased in terms of its prevalence and until you know where it is. And the only way to know where it is is if you test because up to 30% of people with the virus don't have any symptoms. So the only way you know if they have the virus is to do testing. So that's point one. Point two is this virus spread from China to Seattle, to California, and to Arizona. 10,000 miles, no problem. And it spread from Germany and France to New York City across the Atlantic Ocean, no problem. So if anybody thinks that that virus can't cross a arbitrary state border, that's, that's crazy. So the, the 
the state borders are, are not going to be sufficient to protect individuals in the state from being infected with this virus without the presence of a strategy to contain it, which involves testing and social isolation of contacts. That's what needs to happen to avoid other states from having a similar experience to New York and take it from me, you don't want this experience. And I don't want to turn this into a political conversation, although it's probably very easy to do so, but on the medical side of it for you, again, staying apolitical, on the medical side of it for you, when you hear the economists weigh in and the, you know, all, of the, all of the non-medical factors, it has to be frustrating because everything you just indicated to me tells me how dangerous this is and how easy it is to, to fall back into where we were a month ago. COVID is not a primary economic problem. It is not. The economy certainly suffers as a result of COVID, no doubt. The markets have taken a big hit. Markets hate uncertainty. Just think about the uncertainty that will happen if there is an increase in the virus spread in states that are lightening up their restrictions. Just when we think that the virus spread is under control, where there may be a little bit more certainty in the markets. That will go away in a heartbeat if there's a, a recurrence in, in the type of spread that we're seeing right now. So yeah, it's not a primary economic problem. The economy suffers as a result of this, but I would think it's gonna be much worse and the markets will be much worse if the primary problem is not controlled. We have okay, to think of long term instead of short term. Let's, let's take a couple of more questions. This is from Phil who says, what nutritional supplements do you recommend? Well, certainly there is very good reason to persist on a well-rounded nutritional diet that provides all the daily requirements. There is not any specific nutrient or vitamin that will be more helpful than any other. So I, I would stick really towards eating well, eating healthy, and being physically active. Those types of activities have a higher chance of keeping us healthy. It's interesting, I, I went to the grocery store today and I know that people are ordering their groceries from home and, and, that's, and that's fine and maybe that's what I should have done, but I had the mask and the gloves and yeah. with social distancing, I was doing all of it. But, and, and, and the grocery stores down here in South Florida, they have, you know, one-way aisles now. So they're doing their best, I think, to mitigate contact. But there was one lady, and by the way, you need a mask to get into the store, but there was one lady who had taken it off, did not have a mask, did not have gloves. And, and I, it just made me angry because I, I feel like we, we all have to be in this together, all of us. Because all it takes is a couple of people not following the rules that are really inconvenient, by the way, for the rest of us, but we have to do it. And so I don't know if, you, if, if there's a message there or something you'd like to say about how important it is for every single person to be diligent about this and do their part for the rest of us. Yeah, I, I, I think about that too, because my wife goes to the supermarket just like you, you do. and and. Um, I always worry that she's going to be at risk when, when she goes to the supermarket. And, but we need food, just like right. this. We need food. And the supermarkets have been really good in creating the type of structure you just described to try and maximize social distance and, and keep it clean and keep it safe. And, and, and so we feel, we feel good about that. Yeah, I, I, in the reason we have everybody wearing a mask is not so much to protect us who are wearing the mask, but it's protect others from us. And I think that's really clear. And so it's selfish for somebody to be outside in a position where they're closer than six feet to somebody and potentially put them, that other person at risk, if the person who's not wearing the mask is sick and coughs or sneezes. That is, that is selfish and in fact, that person should um, be directed to don a mask and don gloves. And if they're unable to do so, they should be invited to leave the store. And I think that would be in the best interest of everybody. 
I think I might have invited her to leave the store under my <laughs> breath into my mask. But I, I, don't, I don't know that she heard, but but, uh, but, but I know in some supermarkets, they actually uh, have staff who are the uh, hosts, if you will, and, and do those invitations. And, I, yeah. and those are the kinds of stores that I prefer those who I, I care about to shop in. Uh, what, we've got five more minutes if you'll indulge me because um, there's just, there's just a, a lot of people watching and please get your questions in. This is, you know, this is the most important top of mind topic for all of us now. So uh, again, one more time, if you tuned in late, we are chatting with Dr. Charles Powell, Mount Sinai's Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine and the CEO of Mount Sinai's National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute. He's in New York City. He has seen his fair share every day of COVID-19 patients. To circle back to that, and you know, we've spent some time talking about how things are, are getting a little better. Um, is your team celebrating the victories in the hospital when patients are released now? Uh, you know, you guys have all been through so much and you've unfortunately seen a lot of death. There's no way around it, but now you're seeing people get better. That, that's got to feel great for morale and just, and just be such a positive, uplifting moment for everybody with how hard you've all worked. I think we might have. I'm Just back. A couple of technical snafus, but it, sure. is, it is on on the internet. I think you were asking if there's a celebration when patients leave the hospital. Yeah, just just to to celebrate any of these victories of people recovering. So we've discharged 2,200 patients from the hospital at this point in time, and we consider every one to be in essence a, a victory, and. And we don't have a formal celebration for everybody who, who leaves, but we feel really gratified for every patient that we're able to discharge. And, and that, I think that's really the spirit that helps all the healthcare workers here and other institutions understand the impact that they have in helping patients who are sick with COVID. It's, those are the victories, if you will, that really show us that we're having an impact and, and keep, us, keep us going every day. Last question for me is when this started out, it, we were all told that it essentially affected the elderly and people who were just in poor health and had other underlying physical conditions. And then you just see sort of bits and pieces of younger people getting it too. You're on the front lines of it, you see it. Is it still by and large elderly people and people with underlying physical conditions. You know, I, I, I see younger people who get it just from, from watching TV. What are you seeing with regards to at-risk groups? It's not just, uh, not just the older people who are getting COVID and dying from it. That's not true. It is not true. COVID doesn't care how old somebody is. And in fact, there are a lot of really young people, and young is probably 20 and older because it doesn't affect kids, thank God. Um, but 20 and older who, who get COVID. And mainly, I think part of that's due to how before social distancing occurred, young people tended to congregate in groups much more frequently than adults did. So young people would be infected with it even more, more commonly than older people. But when you start thinking about people in the ages of 30 and 40, those, those, there are a lot of 30 and 40 year olds hospitalized. And they're not old and they don't come in with pre-existing conditions. They're young, healthy, running around, throwing footballs and boom, they're in the hospital with COVID and they're very sick. So it is wrong to think just because you're young, you're not gonna get COVID. It's wrong to think just because you're young, you're not gonna get very sick from COVID. It's wrong. You just gotta avoid getting COVID. And the way you avoid getting COVID is to stay apart. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, informative, inspirational. It's always great to talk to somebody who is on the front lines, risking their lives to save other lives. I can't thank you enough, Dr. Powell, for joining us. If there's anything you want to say, um, any, any, if you'd like people to go to a certain website for more information, or, or if you just want to say goodbye, the, the floor is yours. Well, I'd say, first off, please do your part and stay apart. Secondly, I want to say that all the healthcare workers hear you around the world, around the country, 
and, and hear you and, and your support of everything that healthcare workers do. And, and we're really appreciative of, the, of, of your support as well. And, and the third thing, again, stay apart. We can't say that enough. <laughs> All right, it's it's been great to talk to you, and uh, you know, anytime you want to uh, come back on the show, if you've got new information, love to have you. Have a great day, Dr. Powell. Great to see you. Thank you. You too, Dave. Bye bye. Bye. Care. And thank you everybody for watching. We'll have another new episode next Wednesday at 4 p.m. And I'll promote it throughout the week. We'll let you know who we're going to have on. And by all means, if you are watching and if you know a hero no matter where you live around the United States of America somebody who deserves to be recognized for the work they are doing in their community we've got some great names already coming in but we could always use more so if there's someone you think that I should chat with on this show uh, to highlight the great work they're doing I'd love to hear about it so you can just DM me thank you so much for watching I'll repost this so you can see it again and uh, I really appreciate it thanks everybody see you again next Wednesday at 4